All right, so this is Najee Dorsey again for another installment of Via Talks, and today we're with Matisse Vadola. Am I pronouncing that right, Matisse? Yes, you are. All right, sounds good. The uh, just a little background: founded in 2006, Gallery Matisse is a contemporary fine art gallery which represents emerging to mid-career artists who have achieved national, regional, national, and international acclaim. Originally in uh, originally in D.C., now based in Baltimore. And I must admit, I love your mission statement. The mission of the gallery is to utilize the visual arts to raise awareness of arti- artists who deserve recognition for their contributions and artistically portraying our historic and cultural landscapes and to recognize art movements that pave the way for freedom and artistic expression. Welcome to Bio Talks. Yeah, thank you, Najee. I really appreciate the opportunity to speak with you. My pleasure. Um, you know, Martise, before we get into the topic of, of, of why I'm trying to gather my my colleagues, fellow, fellow uh, gallerists in the business about this New York Times article that came out, talk to us a little bit about, you know, running the gallery and, and how you got started. You know, what's going on with Gallery Martise right now? Well, things are going very well for the gallery. Um, in terms of exhibitions, uh, we have Africa. Well, first we have Ronald Jackson, uh, profile of color, and uh, that starts June thirtieth. In the fall, speaking of artists who've paved the way for artistic expression, um, I'm had the honor of hosting the Africobra group, mm-hmm. which, for many, uh, they know that they kind of their voice and artistic expressions gave birth to the black arts movement. So I'm excited to be uh, hosting that. And then following that is uh, Delita Martin between Sisters and Spirits. And we are going to be participating in um, Art Miami during uh, Basel. So uh, dynamic um, exhibition calendar Mm -hmm. and uh, art fairs coming up. So yeah, things are going quite well. Well, sounds sounds good. You're doing great work, and always got a, a fantastic stable of artists uh, that I thoroughly admire. I mean, I'm looking at you know you. Um, Alfred Conte's work on your website, and mm-hmm. yes. and Delita, and I know uh, Ronald was working with Ronald a while back, and I really love the new work that he's doing, particularly the ones with the mask. Oh my yes. goodness! Yes, yeah. So oh, those are really amazing, aren't they? They are. So. Um, how did you take this New York Times article that came out? And let me just 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 pave the way. The title the title was what really kind of got me. It says, "Why have there been no great black art dealers?" Yeah. Well, I guess you can pose that question uh, if you haven't done any research on the history of black art and the art dealers that helped pave the way for the market. Um, as it is today. Mm -hmm. So I was very uh, disappointed um, with the article's title, found it provocative. Um, I'm sure it sparked a lot of conversations, um, especially within the African American community. Uh, I have many clients that passed it on and were very insulted Mm -hmm. because it failed to recognize dealers such as June Kelly, Bill Hodges, uh, Nicole uh, in Chicago, Stella Jones, Mm -hmm. uh, Parrish, Norman Parrish, Peg Alston, Merton Simpson. I mean, the list goes on and on. I'm following in the footsteps of many uh, black dealers who fought to have the right to have those spaces exist Mm -hmm. and to help to launch the careers of many black artists who later uh, were, I call it, harvest by white galleries who, um, you know, come in and scoop them up once those, all, all the lion's share, so to speak, of the work has been done. Preach, preach. Yeah. Yeah, that's I'll what, real. yeah, that's, what, that's, that's, <laughs> that's what I'm talking about. Now we getting at the, at, at the crust of the whole matter, you know, I mean, that's mm-hmm. absolutely true. We, I mean, the galleries, have have never really gotten their due, and the one thing that 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 has really gotten under my collar is that, you know, all when these stories come out, they rarely have a tendency to even reference not only the black galleries and dealers, but even you know the African American collectors or the collectors that have have, have collections focused on African American art. 
uh, you know, of the diaspora in terms of um, uh, referencing them in the articles. It's kind of like, you know, we're just, we, you know, we don't exist. And, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, you know, I call it that ongoing erasure of, you know, black history, the contributions of African-Americans to not only African-American history, to America's history, mm -hmm. because black artists are part of the his America's history and their work reflects our black experiences. And, um, you know, so for the author who I know nothing about, mm -hmm. um, I just felt like due diligence was not undertaken and the piece itself because of the lack of research and scholarship to support it uh, was suspect to me all the way through. I was following some of the comments on uh, black art in America and you know one or maybe more than one individual said well I don't know any black art dealers and I'm like but you're making a comment on black art in America. Look at the work that Najee is doing. Let's just start there. So maybe in our community, you know, we need to define what a black art dealer is. Mm -hmm. And it, you know, it's a person who sells the work of black artists, um, who helps to promote them, build their careers. Um, for me, it also means placing them in exhibitions in the hands of private and individual uh, private collectors and institutions, you don't necessarily have to have a gallery space mm -hmm. to be considered an art dealer. I mean, now I wear the hat of art dealer and gallerist because I have a physical space, but many for many years I didn't. I've been in the business for 30 years. My gallery is going, is about 14 years old now. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, let's look at your platform and the opportunities that you're providing for black artists who may never be represented by someone who has a physical gallery space, but your effort is so important because there are so few black, black, black galleries that exist. Yeah, so much in the industry is needed and so much in the industry has changed. I mean, not only, you know, the, the, the space that the galleries provide to showcase the work, but, you know, let's talk about expanding the audience. You know, putting on uh -huh. a program and all the expense that it takes to, you know, to have a space to, to do the advertising, to build relationships um, and, and all that takes work and a lot of effort. Um, and it's a challenge. And then you start to take a look at the different, you know, sp spaces that ex that extend up past the galleries, like the different festivals and fairs that are, you know, kind of going by the wayside. For the uh -huh. most, I mean, I'm reminded of, I mean, we both remember Josh and the, the National Black Fine Arts Show and how uh -huh. important that was to the industry. And so um, there's so much of this history that needs to be told, you know, stories untold or stories forgotten. And we can't let them, you know, whitewash, you know, the work that has been done. You know, you talk about articles and things that have, they kind of get up under your skin. What about the one that came out to talk about rediscovering of, of, of Sam Gilliam? I'm like, I know people that's been buying, that was buying Gilliam work for decades, you know? Yes, it's, so. yes. It's all about who's validating what, mm -hmm. who's giving it credit, how accepting it is in certain communities mm -hmm. and by certain collectors and institutions because institutions play a major role. I mean, a lot of them now are trying to correct the history of having uh, neglected to acquire the work of African American artists. Mm -hmm. And there's also a uh, article that came out uh, in Bloomberg uh, that the title was Wall Street Rush oh, to yeah. Scoop Up Black Art mm -hmm. Sends Prices Sky High. Mm -hmm. And that came out in April, uh, yeah, April 18th. So it's, you know, it, again, it depends on who's writing the piece and how far reaching uh, they want the article to go. Because really that was coded for, you know, in New York where you have the Wall Street people with the six and seven digit salaries, they're now buying up black art um, in ways that are unprecedented. Mm -hmm. A lot of that's being driven by, you know, the, I, I, I study the market very carefully because I operate in the first and secondary market realm. And so I'm always watching the uh, auction results. Sure. And, you know, a lot of white people are now being priced out of the Picassos and the Rauschenbergs mm -hmm. and others. And so now they're looking for 
other ways to invest their monies. And they're looking at black art because our art overall is still undervalued. Mm -hmm. If you look at the work, the prices that Gilliam's contemporaries have garnered, he's just making his way into that, that, those price ranges. And so with our work being undervalued, our infrastructure being so weak, mm -hmm. you know, that makes our art and artists a prime target for those who have the disposable income to buy, you know, at a frenzied pace. But it's the fetishization of black art. It's like we're the new um, orange is the new black. Well, black is the new black. OK, mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> so our, our work is being sought after um, and consumed uh, by our people as well. I mean, fortunately, I have clients who are committed to supporting my gallery, um, white, black, and blue, um, because they understand the mission and what I'm seeking to achieve here, sure. and that's to elevate black art, to support black artists. And I don't solely represent African-American artists, mm -hmm. um, but that is my area of specialization, and that is my primary focus. Yeah, the... Um... Man, there's so much. There's so much to kind of get into um, on that. I'm, I'm, I'm almost at a loss. I don't know where to begin. Uh, the market always has a need for new product, and like, like you mentioned, um, you mm -hmm. know, art is a commodity. It's, it's. They've been priced out because of the, um, the Warhols and the, and the, and the Picassos, as you mentioned. But you know, art is a commodity, and I think mm -hmm. one of the challenges that that I'm seeing is the collectors who are, who are interested in art and only buying. And only looking at you know the the prices and the speculation on on certain blue you know blue chip or art that's represented by a lot of the galleries primarily in you know in the you know New York and in in L A and abroad or what what have you are you seeing that to be the case I mean are the collectors are you having how can I frame this um, collectors who are still still interested in the material you got but got an eye at on the on the on the works that are bringing command at a higher value points. I mean, are you are you running to any to that any of that at all? Oh, absolutely. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are clients of mine who drop by strictly for financial investment. Mm -hmm. Point blank, there's no question in my mind. Um, it becomes part of their port asset portfolio, <laughs> and there is no other intention behind it. And again, in watching the auction, there are pieces that paintings, various works of art that repeatedly come to auction. And that's because people are vi buying it for investment purposes. You know, they buy, they hold on to it for a year or maybe even less. Mm -hmm. You'll see it at the spring auction and it returns in the fall auction because they're pushing the price points. Uh, and that is deliberate. They have people that, um, you know, their investment groups that they uh, bring pull their monies together and they buy solely for investment purposes so yeah there are different tiers of collecting in the marketplace and you know there are some of us who are you know right in there I've got clients who buy with the same intention and then there are others that are slowly coming into the fold so people buy you know for a lot of different reasons I think that as uh, our community, we are beginning to understand that and beginning to um, operate in that realm. Um, you know, it's not, for many, it's not just about, you know, decorating our walls, uh, buying something because aesthetically we want to live with it. Mm -hmm. There are people who buy strictly see it as an investment piece. Hey, Black Art in America family, this is Najee Dorsey. Thank you again for listening to another installment of Buy Your Talk. We're going to take a minute to bring you up to speed on some of the things that we've got going. If you uh, enjoy this particular program or the other programs here on Black Art in America and would like to be a patron supporter, we now have that capability. So visit the Patronage uh, link. You can find it in the Educational Resources tab in the navigation bar. I also want to make you aware of we're introducing buyblackart.com will be a fine art listing place for artists and collectors to list works 
at no commissions that's right no commissions so be sure to stay tuned for that that's launching june 1st the other thing is that if you've always wanted to start a business or if you've given thought to starting a business we now have garden art for the soul so look for the garden art biz link in the nav bar and once again thank you for listening to this message of some of the new and exciting things happening with black art in america and we're going back to the program What 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 would you say um, drives the value? How do we build valuation for an artist, uh, an artist body of work and career? How does that mm. process happen? In your... Well, that's a that's a great question, and I, and I have a, a art market equation that I use to make that assessment. Mm. So of course we need the artist, the creator. We need the dealers who are building the artist market promoting their careers. We need the collectors, both private and institution, in order to sustain the artist market. We need the critics and the scholars who are writing about the artists. And then we need the appraisers Mm -hmm. who are reporting the market. So that's how that all coalesces. That's how it all comes together. And um, so, you know, an artist becomes more collectible and desirable when major collectors buy it, certainly when it becomes part of a museum collection. So there's a lot of things that play into that. Um, And sometimes you have to be patient as a collector, especially if you buy the work of an emerging artist. Like a lot of my clients, including myself, were kicking ourselves for not having bought an Amy Sherrill painting. I represented Amy before she became the Obama portrait um, person. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, so you have to buy with your eye and sometimes, again, for other purposes. Um, No one knew that she was going to end up being as popular as she is and doing as well. Although we always hope that that is the case. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that those are the types of wonderful stories in our community that we want to celebrate an artist that goes on to become an internationally acclaimed artist. And certainly Kehinde is as well. So I celebrate their success. So, I mean, the, 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 I know you work with Amy for a while. Did you not, so did Uh you not, did you not acquire any works for yourself, uh, for your personal collection? I did not. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. I did not. And trust me, that has been a lesson that will never be repeated. So all of my artists, especially now, because things have gotten so crazy with everyone's career, right. my primary collection focus is now the artists that I represent because I love their work. I know that's and, right. And um, yeah, so, you know, you just start where you are, right? Right. And because um, you never know when those relationships will end, when the artists will move on. Mm-hmm. Um and so I've learned because I knew that Amy was very special when I was working with her. Mm-hmm. And I certainly see her talent, the same level of talent in the artists that I currently represent. Oh, without, so, a, with, without a doubt. And, and you yeah. know, there's, there's, there's some, there's some artists that, you know, I, I, I think the highest, uh, uh, the highest um, praise I can give them is to call them the truth. And, uh, oh, yeah. and and you've got you've got you've got one in particular. I, I make no bones about it. I think Alpha Country's Alpha Country is, is absolutely the truth. Um, and so anybody anybody mm-hmm. that's out there that's looking uh, for for a contemporary artists, uh, definitely definitely on high recommendation. Look at that brother's work and and get it. But getting back to it, let me say this quick thing about about Amy, uh, yes. p- particularly because. You know, she's she's originally from Columbus. I'm a I'm a transplant to Columbus, mm-hmm. Georgia, mm-hmm. and I remember being introduced to her work shortly after I had the solo show here, and I immediately sent it to the museum director and encouraged him to say, "Yo, you know, you know, you should give, you should really look, consider giving Amy a show." You know, I also recall being on an early committee uh, when he was talking about acquiring work, and see, I'm always an advocate for. You know, not being this me too kind of kind of collector where your institution or or an individual, and so the question becomes, and in, in one of the meeting was that, 
you know, do you want to just say that, oh, we have a catlet and we have a beard uh-huh. just like everybody uh-huh. else? Or do you want to uh, do you want to acquire, you know, the people who are making statements today, the, ex- exactly. the, ex- the exceptional artists of the day? Uh-huh. And uh-huh. so that's what I was advocating for. And Amy was definitely one of those artists among many that that I would definitely that I was definitely pushing for them to consider. Uh, but let me but speaking of institutions and, and museums, because you mentioned them earlier about placement. Are you have you had much success? Because I've got some ex, some some experiences, and I'm just wondering, you know, how 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 has it been for you in terms of working with museums and the placement of works? Yeah, well, um, that's an avenue that I'm continuing to make inroads in. Mm-hmm. Um, I do have um, a, a relationships with a lot of museum curators, mm-hmm. and yes, I have been successful in placing. Uh, many of my artists' works in museum collections. Mm-hmm. Um, so I hope within the next couple of months to have some major announcements um, to make about that. And also something that is really exciting that's brewing around Alfred Conti. Um, I have to keep it under wraps for the moment, but okay. when it happens uh, officially, then I'll give you a call back, and then you can announce it. <laughs> Sounds Since good. You, you just put it out there, what, what a big fan of his that you are. Absolutely. So, yes, but um, where the successes have been with the museum acquisitions mm-hmm. is mostly with museums that follow your philosophy because, you know, we have these – artists who are incredibly talented and speaking in a contemporary voice about what the situation and the world is today. Mm -hmm. But I think in the past, what has happened is museums wanted to buy what was familiar to them, what had already been validated and um, where there was a lot of scholarship. Mm -hmm. And so we still are struggling with, although there's some dynamic young curators coming up, um, who are now beginning to write about the contemporary artists, most of the scholarship in the past, of course, was about, you know, the uh, Bearden and Mm -hmm. a cat lit. And so they've been written about over and over and over again. And so we now we have this new breed of contemporary curators that are coming along and looking at the artists of the day. So I know that their scholarship is going to make a huge difference. Yeah. You know, one of the you're absolutely correct. One of those differences that we need is 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 really the institutions because okay, let me let me just put this put this framework out there. So we got the artists, and now they're you know because of the uh, the gaps in the collections, and now they're reaching out to get the work and things of that nature. We understand that part of the problem also is the lack of the of institutions seeking out and building relationships with African American owned dealers and galleries. It's like we have this pool. You know, there's this pool of two or three dealers, and you know what I'm talking mm-hmm. about. That as it yes. relates to, you know, who they're going to buy work from, you know, from you know, that, that that's carrying black material. I mean, you take mm-hmm. a look at. I mean, this is a perfect example. And I, you know, maybe I don't know. Maybe I, I'm, I'm sure I don't have all the all the behind the scenes dealers and everything. But what when 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 Bill Hodges had Norman Lewis's estate and was and was pushing mm-hmm. that work. and then shortly after he, you know, no longer carries it, then next thing you know, you got institutions. Uh, making announcements about about recent acquisitions of of the work of Norman Lewis, and we know who's holding that material, and so it's like, oh yeah, you know, and so I and I I, I even have a personal experience of an artist. I I took a museum co- collections committee around to do two artist studio visits and introduce them to work of artists that was at the gallery, and they didn't even they didn't even reach out to us to buy the work or eat, or not even buy the work, get the work from us. For the exhibition of the artists that we had introduced them to, so until uh-huh. the, until until we you know piece this puzzle, or or you know bring it to their attention that hey listen if we're introducing work or seek out the work seek, seek out the build relationships with the dealers in the field because we're the ones pushing the valuation we're the one introducing the people to the work and and selling the artist's work and carrying them along and and doing the best we can I mean we, we can't be left out of the equation. All I have to say is, amen. <laughs> I mean, you just laid it out that those relationships that white galleries have with uh, museums, they are ingrained there for, they've just had 
such an advantage over African American uh, gallery owners um, because they have been around for far more years than we have. They were able to develop and have been able to sustain those relationships because black art was so ignored. And so, again, going back to who validates it, mm-hmm. who uh, says that it's credible, you know, they have now they're the voice as opposed to our being the voice of, of that. Mm-hmm. And um, so it, it's this it's systemic. And um, so as black gallerists, but as a black gallerist, because maybe all black gallery owners don't have the same challenge that challenges that I do mm-hmm. um, you know that is one area that I still am challenged with yeah. and um, I'm making inroads but I have you know I've, I'm following behind people who are light years ahead of me who um, as you said are ta- have taken over the estates of black artists who have passed away and have also coupled with that the relationships with galleries I'm sorry, with museums Mm -hmm. that, you know, they can easily pick up the phone and say, I'll loan you these works so that you can launch a major exhibition and retrospective Mm -hmm. about this particular artist. So, you know, it it is a, it is the truth. It's the white truth about how this um, industry operates. And um, the only thing I can do is just continue to, Uh, do what I believe is necessary and important to make my gallery known, Mm -hmm. to put my artists out there, and to try to form relationships with uh, curators as best that I'm able. Um, You know, and I, again, I have a wonderful uh, group of collectors who are very influential, and they've helped to make some inroads. And sometimes they even challenge them to say, why aren't you buying through this gallery? Right. So that, you know, almost shaming them and a lot of them should be shamed and that's why a lot of them are deassessing work out of their collection Mm -hmm. to kind of right the wrong of history of having been so neglectful of black art right you know another thing too i mean not that not to get on a tangent about you know uh the challenges you know because we have some we have some success particularly in with the direct relationships we have with individual collectors that what definitely keeps us going but to a certain uh-huh. some to a certain extent you know I, I just know that they don't have this they don't have the scrutiny that we have when we're pitching work you know what i mean it's kind of uh-huh. like uh I've, I've experienced that and there's a certain privilege that they that they have access to and the last thing that i'm gonna say on this note is that as it relates to you know the shows like i mean we produced black uh boutique art fairs for the last five years you know i mean uh-huh. carrying legacy artist work and contemporary artist work we have yet whether it was in new york miami houston uh-huh. benville kansas city or, or what have you we have yet to have a collection committee or curators come to the shows that we've invited them to come uh-huh. to and why uh-huh. is that you know they got you know we can't you know we can't they just can't be lazy and just go to to basel and armory you know and not be looking for new talent and, and, and new opportunities and, and other venues. So with that being said, our next show, September 14th through the 16th at the Belmont Mansion in Philly, is going to be the next Black Art in America Fine Art Show, and, and uh, would definitely love for, for, for people to be aware of that. Uh, Mertice, you're doing a fabulous job, and you know we got to let more people know about what you're doing. I look forward to getting the information on, on, on Alfred's um thing that you've got coming up with him that's going to be uh, fantastic do you have any any parting thoughts that you would like to share before we go uh just to thank you for providing the platform for this important discussion to take place uh for allowing me to talk about my gallery and my efforts to you know can build and sustain um the black artists uh you know and their market their position in the market, Mm -hmm. and just to ask your followers to consider what you're doing and what I'm doing as very relevant and important, and that we need their financial support in order to continue, um, you know, on the path, Uh, because without it, we, I'm sure you and I are fully aware of how few Black-owned galleries that they 
mm-hmm. that exist. And I mean, there are less than 5% when you compare it to the number of white owned galleries that are out there. So, you know, again, our art is being consumed, sought after and bought. Um, Our artists are, you know, uh, ones who are creating important work and we need the people within our community to understand the importance of that and to support it. Absolutely. I couldn't, 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 couldn't say it any better. And for people to um, find you on the web and, and all that good stuff, how would they get in hold of you? Great. Thank you. So we are gallerymertise.com or .net, and it's gallery is spelled the French way, so it's G-A-L-E-R-I-E. My first name is Mertise. It's M-Y-R-T-I-S. So look us up. We're in Baltimore. Uh, We're on Instagram and Facebook. Uh, Would love for your folks to reach out and let me know that they heard our discussion. And I will certainly be sending my followers your way so they can take part and listen in and make comments on this discussion that we've had here today. Sounds good. Listen, this this is only the beginning. I'm hopeful uh, that we can get together from time to time and discuss some of the relevant topics that, you know, that affect our industry. I mean, there's so, there's so much to talk about and to share, yes. <laughs> you know what I mean? And so let's, let's definitely do this again. With these. Thanks again for your time and continued success. Thank you. And the same to you. Bye now. This is Najee Dorsey. You listen to another installment of Fire Talks. Be sure to follow Black Art in America at blackartinamerica.com and look for us on your favorite social media platform, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Pinterest. And remember, you can always shop for art online at www.buyblackart.com.